So in lecture 2, let's continue our topic on carboxylic acids, but this time let's discuss carboxylic acid derivatives. So whenever you see a derivative, derivative is things that are obtained from, so these are obtained from carboxylic acids. So remember that whenever the reduction of a carboxylic acid, it changes its oxidation state, so where the carbon will change its oxidation state and undergo reduction. So there are also many reactions where carboxylic acids itself don't change the oxidation state but have a heteroatom. So heteroatom is where in place of OH we have a heteroatom Z. So that heteroatom can be any atom. So depending on the type of atom that the heteroatom contains, we call them carboxylic acid derivatives. So for example, in place of OH if you have chlorine we call it acid halide. In place of uh, one of them, if you have two carboxylate ions that are combining to form, we call that acid anhydride. If you have another, to the oxygen, if you have another alkyl group that is getting attached or, or an alkoxy group in place of NOH, we call that esters. And if you have amino group in place of OH, we call that amides. So any compound when the carbon has three bonds to the electronegative atom is carboxylic acid derivative. So remember that any compound where the carbon has three bonds to electronegative atoms. So chlorine is an electronegative atom. The carboxylate ion is an electronegative atom. Alkoxy ion is an electronegative atom. In the same way amino ion is an electronegative atom. So if the carbon is attached to an electronegative atom, so we call that carboxylic acid derivatives. So even a nitrile can be considered to be a carboxylic acid derivative. Because here even though there is no oxygen, it still has three bonds with a electronegative atom. So here notice that the three bonds that the carbon has is two with oxygen and one with chlorine. If you take it to look at amino, it's one bond with amino and two bonds with oxygen. It's still three bonds with electronegative atoms. So we call that a carboxylic acid derivative. So acid halides and anhydrides are generally compounds that are relatively unstable and are not com common in nature in naturally occurring compounds. So the most common esters and amides are the ones that are most abundant. Esters and amides are the ones that give uh, certain fruits their flavor. For example, pineapple gets its flavor from methyl butanoate. Banana gets its flavor from isopentyl acetate. Pear gets its flavor from butyl acetate. So most of these compounds are uh, the ones that end up giving you the taste. So one good use of knowing these compounds is that its use can, it can replicate the taste of other compounds. For example, if you take pineapple juices, if it says artificial flavor, it means that there is no real pineapple extract in it. It basically has certain compound that tastes like pineapple. So that's the idea. So the next one are proteins. Proteins are also comprised of repeating amide linkages. So what is an amide linkage is bond C double bond O bond NH R on both sides R dash R. So this is an example of an amide linkage. So we call this an amide linkage. or we also call this a peptide bond between C double bond O and NH we call that a peptide bond. All these amide linkages or peptide bonds are the ones that gives the proteins their structure. So high, the larger the, pro, larger the protein the more uh, abundant the peptide bonds. So there are many other compounds that feature amides including some natural sedatives for example like melatonin. So melatonin is the one that helps you sleep. So the generation of melatonin helps you sleep. So it also has an amide bond. So these are common examples where you would see amide bond. So we'll discuss more about amide bonds when we discuss amines. Next, to name an acid halide, we basically replace the ic with il halide. For example, acetic acid, if you have bromine on it, we'll basically replace it with acetyl bromide. Benzoic acid, if you have chlorine there, we replace it with benzoyl chloride or benzyl chloride. So this is benzyl chloride is the systematic name but the benzyl chloride is the common name. So we can use that name as well. If you have an acid halide group that is connected to the ring 
then in place of the carboxylic acid we replace it with carbonyl halide so for example cyclohexane carboxylic acid in place of oh if you replace it with chlorine we call it cyclohexane carbonyl chloride so the carbonyl is the prefix that we generally use here the suffix that we use here in the same way acid anhydrides are named by replacing acid with anhydride so if you take acetic acid in place of acetic acid you are adding a carboxylic group so we'll call that acetic anhydrides in the same way succinic acid removing oh and oh and combining it with a bond between them causes it to become succinic anhydride so this is what we call these are examples of cyclic anhydrides so we'll discuss how the formation occurs as well next you have asymmetric anhydrides are generally named by listing the acids in alphabetical order and then following it with anhydride for example here on one side you have acetic group on one side you have benzoic group so we write it in the common format acetic first because ea is first benzoic second and then write it with anhydride if both sides are the same we can just write once and leave it out if you have two separate ones that are two different for compounds then we'll have to mention both of them separately next one is how to name esters so esters are named by the suffix eight so esters are generally the compounds that we name the alkyl group attached to the oxygen so you can write it as r c double bond to or dash so this or dash is the example of acid uh, ester so esters are named based on eight so for example acetic acid if you remove acetic acid and we add an ethyl group to it we call that ethyl acetate and malonic acid we write it so if both sides we have ethyl groups added we will call that diethyl melonate so the main chain compound that contains the carbon double bond will be named after eight and prefix to it we will write down the groups that are attached to the oxygen so the same risk the rules will apply if the ester is connected to a ring so cyclohexane carboxylic acid so if you have OCH CH3 that has that is being added here then we'll call that methyl cyclohexane carboxylate so basically carboxylic acid we'll write it as carboxylate so that's the way we write these compounds so amides are basically replaced by named by replacing the suffix ic acid or oic acid with amide for example acetic acid is written as acetamide when you have nh2 added benzoic acid in place of oh if you replace it with nh2 we write benzamide so we replace oic acid or ic acid depending on the name with dash amide so that's how we can write down the nomenclature for these compounds so if the amide group it is attached to a ring of carboxylic acid then we write it as carboxamide so then we have cyclohexane carboxamide so whenever you have a ring structure is where most people get confused so please don't confuse whenever you have a ring structure just name it as carboxy whatever is the one that uh, prefix that you generally use use the same prefix over and over again next if the nitrogen atom of the amide group bears alkyl substituents so if the nitrogen atom itself has substituents we write it as n methyl so we write their names and place that the beginning of the name with n as their locate so when you write n you are basically saying that it's connected to the nitrogen so here we are saying that n methyl which means that on the nitrogen there is a methyl group and if you look at this one there are two methyl groups so we'll write it as n comma n dimethyl acetamide notice that this is acetamide basically and the ones that are attached to the nitrogen is what we are trying to name separately from the original compound so nitriles can also be are generally named by replacing the suffix ic acid and oic acid with o nitrile so acetic acid so we are basically replacing oic acid or ic acid with o nitrile for example acetic acid can be written as acetonitrile benzoic acid can be written as benzonitrile so basically when we are doing this with cooh to c triple bond n so this is the naming convention that we generally use so use this principle now and try to solve these problems one by one so pause the video right here and try to 
name these compounds let me do the first one so that you can do the rest for the first one notice that it's an anhydride group on one side you have an anhydride and this is anhydride we want to know what is this acid name so you can name it as 1 2 and 3 the original acid name would be propanoic acid so this is propan anhydride notice that both sides is the same so we can basically write it as propan propan anhydride so this is how we can name anhydrides so if you remember here we basically name replace it with I'm sorry it's actually propanoic anhydride so in plan in front we write it as propanoic anhydride so this is the name for the first compound so in the same way let me do this one here so this one contains an ethyl group and a methyl group on the nitrogen so we have to write n ethyl because e comes first n methyl and you have on this side you have cyclobutane carboxamide so this is the name for this compound so using this principle now try to solve all the other questions so pause the video right here and try to solve these questions next let's talk about reactivity of carboxylic acid derivatives so carboxylic acid derivatives are generally electrophilic at the carbonyl carbon because note, notice that the electrophilicity comes from the fact that the carbon has a double bond so the most reactive is the acyl halides and the least reactive is the amides so hal acyl halides are the most reactive amides are the least reactive So the reactivity can be determined by four main constitu four main factors: induction, resonance, sterics, and the quality of the leaving groups. So let's talk about one by one. So why are acyl halides the most reactive derivatives? The one of the main reasons is induction because the electronegative chlorine points more electron toward distribution towards itself, and it enhances the electrophilic character of the carbonyl group. So this carbonyl group has ends up becoming much more partially positive and chlorine becomes partially negative the other one is resonance the chlorine atom does not donate much electron density to the carbonyl carbon so that is one of the reasons why it generally ha does not have not a significant com contributor in its electrophilic state because it does not donate its electrons readily right so the chlorine does not significantly donate electron density to the carbonyl group that's why the carbonyl group stays more electrophilic and the chlorine stays more electro more nucleophilic next one are amides amides are the least reactive acid derivative what are the factors number one is induction notice that the nitrogen atom is less electronegative than chlorine or oxygen which means that rather than uh, not donating it it actually contributes to the electron density causing it to have a significant contributor so this becomes a significant contributor and enhances it electro positive uh, sorry nucleophilic character than uh, rather than electrophilic character so this is one of the reasons why nitro amides are generally least reactive acid derivatives now the two groups that are electrophilic are aldehydes and ketones are generally also electrophilic but they do not undergo substitution reactions remember that aldehydes and ketones undergo nucleophilic addition reactions they do not undergo substitution reactions so which means notice that the r group on ketone and the hydrogen on the aldehyde they cannot act as a functional leaving group so which means that they cannot undergo substitution reactions but if it has a carboxylic derivative it can function as a leaving group so this is where we talk about the reactions we call nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions so the acyl is the carbon the position adjacent to so acyl here is the position adjacent to the carbon carboxyl carbonyl group 
facile position that's where the substitution occurs so let's take a look at how nucleophilic acyl substitution occurs so the carboxylic derivatives undergo the nu as a nucleophilic acyl substitution so the group the carboxylic derivative group in adjacent to the carbon double bond reacts so the nucleophile replaces it and undergoes substitution so the nucleophile attacks the carbon and the carbon donates its electrons back to z and then it leaves so this is the nucleophilic acyl substitution and this looks simple as it is notice that the first one is the nucleophilic attack where the nucleophile attacks the group and causes it to form and causes it to form a z group and finally the leaving group causes it to form the nucleophile so what happens here in terms of the actual reaction and why is the nucleophile always attacking the carbon because of the character carbon here has a partial positive charge and the oxygen has a partial negative charge because of that reason nucleophiles always love to attack the positively charged carbon and the positively charged carbon when it bonds itself the oxygen gets eight electro six electrons and the six and two electrons it donates back to the carbon and forms a double bond back again and forms the nucleophilic group remember that here the main understanding is that the z should be a good leaving group if it is not a good leaving group it does not undergo this reaction so the tetrahedral intermediate it will form always and then the carbonyl reforms via loss of a leaving group and h minus and c minus generally cannot be expelled as leaving groups that is one of the reasons why aldehydes and ketones do not undergo this reaction so they are not suitable compounds for this specific reaction next let's take a specific example here so let's say we have an acyl chloride benzyl chloride so benzoyl chloride that's attached to a methoxy group so the methoxy group acts as a nucleophile and attacks the carbon the chlorine takes its electrons and leaves so it, this is the intermediate that forms so what happens here when the oxygen donates its electrons back the carbon will donate the electrons back to chlorine and the chlorine will leave here which one will leave depends on which of these depending on the two groups that are attached to the carbon if one of them is better at leaving then that group will leave so here you have two groups methoxy and chlorine depending on which one is good at leaving so which one is a better leaving group that will become eliminated and the carbonyl becomes reformed so here chlorine is a better leaving group than methoxy so chlorine will be the one that leaves as a nucleophile as a negatively charged compound so understand that the nucleophilic acyl substitution is not an sn2 mechanism so in an sn2 mechanism it rather undergoes a reaction where it would change the original structure causing it to form conformations so it's not actually attacking from different sides it's only attacking from one side so what is happening here let's take a look at this process so sometimes in this process is a proton transfer will be necessary in the mechanism so why is this necessary? most commonly under acidic conditions negative charges rarely form and under basic conditions positive charges rarely form so most uh, easiest way of understanding carboxylic acid nucleophilic acyl substitution is to think of it as an sn1 mechanism than an sn2 mechanism so all the participants a reaction mechanism where you have the reactants the intermediates and the leaving group should be consistent with the conditions employed so what are the conditions for example if you take an ether sorry ester and hydrolyze it in presence of an acid it generally forms back into the carboxylic acid this is a this is an example of a nucleophilic acyl substitution but doesn't look that way so the first step will not be a nucleophilic attack because the first thing is that nucleophiles cannot attack directly unless they know where they have to attack so because a negatively charged oxygen will not be produced under basic and acidic conditions so you do you have that reaction cannot occur so it needs a high activation energy and it does not even the ones are unstable so before nucleophilic attack what should happen depending on the condition there are two different compounds that form under acidic conditions the first step will become protonation of the carbonyl group 
So when it gets protonated, it generally creates a positive charge on the oxygen. So first thing happens is that the oxygen here attacks a proton and then gets protonated. Under protonation now is the first, generally always the first step in an acyl substitution mechanism that happens under acidic conditions. So nucleophilic attack on the protonated carbon, carbonyl makes much more sense under acidic conditions because the net activation energy required is much less than in comparison to the amount of activation energy required when you are starting directly from the carbonyl group itself. So this is the first uh, thing to remember. The second one is under basic conditions what will happen? Under basic conditions the carbon is not protonated first, the strong nucleophile would attack first. So here the strong nucleophile consider here is the OH group that will attack first creating the compound. Here there is uh, enough in activation energy for it to undergo that reaction. Remember that under acidic conditions it cannot happen, nucleophile does not attack. But under basic conditions a strong nucleophile would be able to attack first. Now next, when an amine is the nucleophile it will attack the carbonyl first without the carbonyl being protonated first. This is the rare case where you would see in acidic, acidic conditions, you would see the basic conditions where you have a weak nucleophile attacking. So if you have an amino group that also undergoes the formation where it creates a positive negative charge on the oxygen and a positive charge on NH3 amine. So remember that just be sure to avoid drawing an intermediate with two charges of the same type. So you cannot have the two charges of the same type, both cannot have a negative charge. One will get a positive charge, the other will get a negative charge when we draw acyl substitution mechanisms. So proton transfers are utilized in mechanisms to remain consistent with the conditions that we are employing. Under general acidic conditions, there can be up to three proton transfers necessary in the mechanism. So we start always with the proton transfer. The second is a nucleophilic attack and after that we still get another proton transfer and then a loss of leaving group and finally again another proton transfer. So whether the conditions are acidic, neutral or basic, you will have to decide where proton transfers occur in the mechanism. So for example, consider the mechanisms that we have here, consider the mechanism for the following reaction. We are, we are starting with an acyl chloride and under hydrolysis it creates the acetic carboxylic acid and HCl. Now notice that the conditions are not acidic here. So because there is no acid involved, the reaction will not, the reaction that is occurring here will not start with the proton transfer. So the first reaction that will happen here is going to be the nucleophilic attack. So the H2O group will directly attack the carbon creating a negative charge on the oxygen and a positive charge on H2O. Now when the oxygen donates its electrons back, the chlorine will be the one that leaves first because it's a better leaving group. It takes the electrons and leaves. So once it leaves, what happens here? The oxygen is unstable because it generally should have three bonds but it only has two bonds. So what will happen again another proton transfer will occur where H2O will attack the proton and remove it and the oxygen will gain its electrons back to finally form the COOH group. So the carbonyl in general is not protonated first because the reaction is not acidic. Now the leaving group does not require protonation in order to leave but there is proton transfer at the end. So remember that there is no reason there is where it has to occur at a specific point. Proton transfer can occur at any part of the reaction depending on the conditions that are possible in the reaction. Next, the pattern is typical for reaction with acid halides. So when you react with acid halides, there is no proton transfer in the first part. There is no proton transfer in the third part. You only have one proton transfer at the end. The first thing that happens is a nucleophilic attack. The second thing that happens is a loss of leaving group. And the third one is the proton transfer. So once you start drawing more and more mechanisms like these, you will be able to understand how the mechanisms will occur here. So let's take an example of a mechanism and let's try and understand how the mechanism will occur. So here we have an ester. The ester here has, you have H plus and ETOH ethyl alcohol, ethanol and it forms it forms the ester with the ethyl group so we are basically replacing with OME with OET and you have methoxide. 
Now this reaction, the first one, notice that there is a H plus. So this is an acidic condition. For the acidic condition here, the first thing it has to undergo is proton transfer. So now let's try and understand the mechanism. So remember the common mechanism here. So the common mechanism is proton transfer. And then after that we have the nucleophilic attack. After that we have proton transfer. After that we have the loss of leaving group. And finally we have the last one which is again proton transfer. So use this template now and let's try and find the mechanism in this reaction. Now. So notice the reaction that we are doing here is we are starting with the ester given. So this ester we are converting it into So we are converting this ester into this ester. So for this reaction to occur, remember the basic template of reactions that are happening here. So use that template whenever you are writing down the reactions. Now let's write down the reactions one by one. So let's start with the first one. We know that this is acidic conditions because in the problem it is given as H plus and ETOH. So in, in presence of ETO, ETOH, what is going to happen here? You do not need any H2O again. Notice that because it is already acidic, so you do not need any H2O again. So this creates the first reaction, again proton transfer is the first reaction that occurs. So let's look at how the reaction will look like. So the reaction you have the ester, we start with OME. Because it's an acid, the ethyl alcohol ends up getting two hydrogen groups and one OH group on one side. So because it creates a positively charged ethyl group, so the oxygen side. The oxygen here has ends up getting another H group and the ethyl group obviously, so you have a positively charged one. So the first one that undergoes is the proton transfer, so where the first reaction is oxygen to the proton. The proton donates its electrons back to oxygen creating it to be a neutral charged atom creating the first reaction. We end up getting a double bond oxygen and hydrogen with a positive charge and two electrons with OME on this side. So this is the first one. The second process is the nucleophilic attack. So let's take a look at the next one which is the nucleophilic attack. So what happens during nucleophilic attack here? So let's start with the compound that we got at the end of last reaction. So we have oxygen, a double bonded oxygen with a positive charge and one lone pair of electrons and a hydrogen and OME. So in the second one, the ETOH itself acts as the nucleophile and the oxygen attacks the carbon. So when the oxygen attacks the carbon, so what is going to happen to the reaction here? It creates, so when it attacks, this particular ox carbon donates its electrons back to oxygen and oxygen becomes OH on top. So you get an OH group on top and on the bottom we end up getting OME and on this side we end up getting oxygen with hydrogen on one side and ET on the other side. So with two lone pair, two one lone pair of electrons and a positive charge. So this is the intermediate compound that you end up getting. This tetrahedral intermediate because it is unstable so it has to undergo the next another proton transfer again. Remember that we are only going to write the proton transfer when it is necessary. Notice that there is an excess proton so which means that there is a need for 
proton transfer here. So what's going to happen in this reaction now? So the compound that we have here, so let me copy the same compound. So this compound here, undergoes the reaction in the presence of ATOH. So what's going to happen in this reaction here? The oxygen will attack the proton and the, pro the proton will donate its electrons back to oxygen causing it to form OET. So what's going to happen here? You have OH on the top and on the bottom we have OME with two lone pairs of electrons. and oxygen here with two lone pairs get back ET again. Now this structure again what's going to happen next the compound that you have when you react this here will end up forming so this will end up forming so the oxygen H H E T. So this is the product that you have get that you get here with a positive charge and two lone pairs of electrons. We'll end up noticing that this is a proton now. So again, it undergoes the same reaction. So the OME here will attack the proton. The proton will donate its electrons back to oxygen. So this creates the intermediate O H here and O E T here. And on the bottom we have oxygen ending up on hydrogen on one side and methyl group on one side with two electrons and a positive charge. So this is the intermediate for the second process. The next one is the last one which is the loss of leaving group. So the loss of leaving group. So let me copy the compound that we got at the last part. So this is the compound that we got. Now this under presence of, so what will happen now? Here, the oxygen with its two lone pairs donates its electrons back to the carbon. The carbon now don't leaves the electrons and this ends up becoming minus MeOH and you end up forming the final for compound OET and OH, double bonded OH with a positive charge and one lone pair of electrons. Now this is the intermediate that you end up getting again. This intermediate now undergoes the last reaction which is proton transfer again. So proton transfer again. Again what is going to happen? Ethyl alcohol that originally starts the reaction. The oxygen will attack the hydrogen. The, so let me write it separately so that so it attacks the hydrogen, the hydrogen donates its electrons back to oxygen. Finally you end up forming oxygen with two lone pairs and O8. So this is your answer. So there are five processes that we are talking about here. So number one is the proton transfer where you end up getting a proton on the oxygen. Number two is the nucleophilic attack where E2OH attacks the carbon and creates an OH group, an OME group and an OET group with an alcohol hydrogen extra and then undergoes again the third process proton transfer again and finally the fourth process the loss of leaving group where the methyl alcohol leaves and the fifth process which is the proton transfer process. So this is the reaction that occurs here. So try to use the same principles that we used before and try to propose the mechanism for these reactions. So pause the video right here and try to solve these problems.